Welcome to the Consulting Specifying Engineer webcast, HVAC New Chiller Requirements. I'm your moderator, Jack Smith, and I'm happy to join you today on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer at CFE Media. Presenting today are two members of the Consulting Specifying Engineer Editorial Advisory Board. Jason Gerke is a mechanical engineer with Grafe in Milwaukee. He has 12 years of mechanical design, commissioning, and project management experience, and he has designed mechanical systems for a variety of project types, including industrial, commercial, education, and resort entertainment facilities. Jason's current responsibilities include team leader for the mechanical and plumbing group, project management for multidiscipline buildings, and mechanical engineering design duties. J. Patrick Bonza is a senior mechanical engineer at Smith Seckman Reed in Houston. Pat has more than 30 years experience in the consulting engineering field with at least 25 years in healthcare design and engineering. He is responsible for HVAC, plumbing, and fire protection design for hospital and healthcare projects and he has authored several articles on HVAC systems, smoke control, and related codes and standards. And he has presented at a variety of technical conferences. Thank you both for joining us today, and Jason Gerke will speak first. Let's get started. Thank you, Jack. Good morning to those of you on the West Coast, and good afternoon to everyone else. As Jack mentioned, my name is Jason Gerke, and I manage the mechanical and plumbing group at Grafe in our Milwaukee office. As Jack already shared, we will be discussing changes to ASH rate 90.1 related to chiller efficiencies. These standard updates will change how some of you select equipment and may have major changes for some engineers and manufacturers. Of course, this depends on the markets you serve and the project types you design. Our presentation today will focus on the changes to 90.1, which will be effective January 1st, 2015. The discussion will cover what the changes are, how to select equipment in compliance with these updates, and finally review some specific topic engineers and probably manufacturers should consider when selecting equipment for projects, uh, which will be submitted after these changes take effect. Pat will go into some detail uh, with some tedious calculation methodology as well. So to get started, I'd like to start off the technical part of this presentation with a short discussion about ASHRAE 90.1. As we all know, the standard affects how we design buildings and select equipment. The standard provides minimum efficiencies for equipment, operating characteristics for that equipment, and requirements for building construction. The standard, again, as we all know, is written in code enforceable language and has been adopted as the energy code for a number of states and municipalities. Currently, 13 states have adopted this standard as their energy code based on information obtained from the U.S. Department of Energy Building Energy Codes Program. The 90.1 standard was first published in 1975, partially in response to the oil embargo. The standard has been updated numerous times over the years. And one of the addendums, which will be adopted on the first day of January uh, 2015, will affect chiller efficiencies. The standard undergoes regular updates and is part of ASHRAE's continuous maintenance program, which allows the standard to be updated multiple times a year and on a regular three-year cycle. So diving in, what is addendum CH? This addendum covers three main topics. The first one being increased efficiency of chillers, and along with that, it aligns the requirements for a few different chiller types as related to efficiencies. The second item is the standard adopts the latest version of AHRI 550-590, which cover water-cooled and air-cooled chillers. Uh, these standards provide a reference for equipment testing. And then finally, the third thing is the adopted addendum will officially exclude high lift and heat pump chillers, uh, which are sometimes difficult to uh, prove compliance to a code authority, as we, uh, have, many of us have probably experienced that as engineers. Now diving into what each of these three items really mean. 
the first item on increasing chiller efficiency will now make the required efficiency approximately 8.3% higher than the original version of 90.1 in 2010. This, uh, the efficiency increase will also raise the minimum requirement to be 23.1% on average compared to the 2004 version of 90.1. So definitely a significant increase in efficiency. Besides increasing chiller efficiencies, the addendum will require positive displacement water-cooled chillers to meet the same efficiency requirements as water-cooled centrifugal chillers. So now reciprocating screw and scroll compressors have the same efficiency requirements as centrifugals. The other important item to note in this part is that air-cooled chillers are now allowed to follow compliance methodology path B. That will explain this compliance path in more detail later. And continuing with the detail of addendum CH, another item, uh, another one of the changes in this soon to be adopted addendum relates to the AHRI standards 5550 and 5, I'm sorry, 550 and 590. These standards have been updated to align with the new efficiency and compliance requirements. The reference standards have also been updated to separate the standards between uh, metric units uh, when testing air-cooled or water-cooled chillers. Pat will also dive into more detail on the AHRI standard updates. And then finally, the addendum excludes high lift and heat reclaim chillers from compliance with 90.1. These chillers are typically operating in very specific and very special conditions, which do not compare to testing at AHRI conditions. Sometimes these chillers may not even be able to operate at the AHRI conditions. I've had selections uh, that I've asked manufacturers to do for me, and when I ask for it standard AHRI conditions, they say, nope, we can't get the output. So that, um, that's a very real issue, and uh, I'm glad that ASHRAE has decided to exclude those from, from this uh, updated uh, standard. Uh, and then uh, as far as ASHRAE's definition of what the high lift applications might be, they're typically defined as condenser water leaving temperatures over 115 degrees. Uh, and then per ASHRAE's own commentary, this is really an arbitrary value and is attempting to exclude these chillers and high lift applications. We all design systems with leaving condenser water temperatures uh, at a variety of temperatures. Uh, 115 degrees is, is typically outside a normal operating range, so that's an excellent cutoff point. Now I'll have a short discussion about compliance with 90.1 and addendum. CH. Uh, compliance with these new requirements in 90.1 related to chiller efficiency will still be accomplished in the ways we use for current projects. Uh, ComCheck is a fairly standard proof of compliance form which is used uh, for uh, and accepted by many plan review authorities. Uh, in my own case, uh, we've personally used output reports from our energy modeling software as well to prove compliance with these requirements. Uh, it is important to consider which portions of the updated standard are relevant to your project. So it's my suggestion that uh, you would establish um, this, this review or, or perform this review early in the code review process before your design is even started. Now Pat is going to dive into how engineers will comply with these requirements. Pat? Thanks, Jason. Uh, one of the, the first things you need to do uh, uh, in uh, uh, using addendum CH is to uh, obviously read it, but uh, the uh, uh, path, path A or B, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, um, is one of the, the, the first things you need to do because the, the numbers for full load and part load values are obviously different. You need to select what type of equipment, whether it's water-cooled, air-cooled, or uh, positive displacement that you're going to have, or a variety of uh, uh, different types of equipment. Each one will have different requirements based on the tonnage. And after that's done, verifying compliance with uh, the addendum and uh, 90.1 is obviously important from a consulting engineer standpoint. So why are there two paths to begin with? Uh, when the, the standard was already was first written, <clears throat> they just listed 
the uh, uh, efficiencies that you needed to. As things went along, the uh, uh, ASHRAE folks and the committees decided that uh, there's more than one way to skin a cat, so to speak. So uh, two different paths, one primarily path A is uh, based on standard conditions. Uh, they can still be adjusted, but the, uh, uh, the path was for both full load and part load values. Path B also has both full and part load values, but the path was added to 90.1 in the 2010 version for part load intensive operation, whereas you weren't operating uh, your equipment primarily at full load, this one allowed for more efficient uh, operation of the equipment. When you look at the table, there's a distinct difference in the values from path A to path B, mainly in the full load and the IPOV values. The IPOVs or the integrated part load values are uh, much lower than in the path A, while the full load values are higher. So when you look at these values and you try to choose which path you're going in, remember that you have to choose a path. You can use path A or path B. You can't mix the values from one to the other. That's not allowed by the standard. So <clears throat> let's talk about standard conditions and definitions for a minute so we can help better understand uh, what 90.1 standard is as well as what changed in this addendum. The current AHRI, which is the American or the Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration Institute standard 550-590, has been around a while, but it was updated, and the current version is the 2011 version. And its title is the standard for performance rating of water chilling and heat pump water heating packages using the vapor compression cycle. That's a mouthful, but uh, the real reason is because it establishes the uh, testing criteria that manufacturers must use in order to get their equipment rated. And when we talk about efficiency, it's defined as the performance at specified rating conditions. The IPLV or the integrated part load values as defined in 90.1 is a single number figure of merit based on part load EER or energy efficiency ratio, COP or coefficient of performance, or KW per ton expressing the part load efficiency for air conditioning and heat pump equipment on the basis of weighted operation at various load capacities for that equipment, not for the system but for the equipment. The NPOV or non-standard part load value is a single number part load efficiency figure of merit calculated and referenced to conditions other than the integrated part load values for units that are not designed to operate at AHRI standard conditions. And non-standard obviously is any condition that is not standard from either a uh, temperature standpoint or water entering or leaving. So in selecting equipment and entering data into a schedule and project documents, it's necessary to know which values to schedule and indicate if they're going to be at non-standard or uh, standard conditions. So what are the AHRI standard conditions if you choose to use those? 44 degree F uh, Fahrenheit leaving chilled fluid temperature, not necessarily water because it might be glycol, it might be a, a variety of mixtures, and and is key, and 2.4 GPM per ton evaporator fluid flow. Coupled with that, it's 85 degree entering condenser fluid temperature with 3.0 GPM per ton condenser fluid flow. Operation at any other condition is considered non-standard. One of the features of the uh, uh, standard 90.1 is table 6.8.1c. It's been there for a couple of versions. And what's different about this one? Well, the, the addendum CH has included a new table 
that replace the completely replace the old one. And it but now it also includes both previous and new values, previous to uh the requirements of January first, twenty fifteen, as well as the new versions. And you'll note when you look at the table that almost everything is underlined, indicating all the additional and replaced information. Even the footnotes are changed, which I think the only exception is note C. That was the only one that I think hadn't changed. The table is represented in the addendum in both inch pound as well as in uh, SI units. It shows both path A and path B values where they apply. It added path B to air cool chillers, which wasn't there anymore. <clears throat> Excuse me. It also added two capacity levels, 300 to 400 tons and 400 to 600 tons to the water cooled centrifugal chiller category. It also revised some nomenclature by adding a full load, or in their case, FL, in, just, in lieu of just units, KW per ton, which it had before. Calculations have been part of 90.1-2010, and this addendum changed some of the terms, such as full load to FL and NPLV or non-standard to just part load value, particularly when it was calculated or recalculated as an adjusted value. Most of the formulas actually remain the same, and the units, kW per ton, also remain the same. So when you select a chiller to operate at AHRI standard conditions, you can just use the values from the table. No additional calculations are needed. You just select the chiller and meet the values or exceed them in most cases, and uh, you're good to go. But for chillers selected at non-standard conditions, both the full load values and the IPLV KW per ton must be calculated and adjusted. We're going to go quickly through the uh, calculations, and uh, not quickly. <laughs> We're going to go through them and just identify the terms and uh, uh, then go through a uh, sample calculation uh, a little bit later. But I think it's important to identify and discuss these uh, so that uh, we know uh, what it is we're talking about or what it is they're talking about in the, in the formulas. So an adjusted full load value is the full load value from the table divided by the adjusted K value, part load, Adjusted is still the integrated part load value divided by the adjusted K value. So what is the K value? Well, it's the constant that you calculate from um, terms A and B, which are calculated using the formulas. Where does full load value come from? Well, it comes from table 6.8.1C, as does the integrated part load value, both of those being in, in kW per ton. What is lift? Lift is the leaving full full load condenser fluid temperature minus the leaving evaporator full load temperature. The key words here are full load, which are essentially the same as your design conditions that you want that chiller to operate under a maximum condition. So calculations for non-standard conditions. Calculating the A value, as you can see, the formula is quite lengthy. The decimals are extremely uh, critical, as well as everything following them. If you note in the uh, uh, the first part of it, where it's lift times uh, or to the nth power, where n equals four, I was just having trouble getting the the superscript in there. So uh, the, when you see the formula, it's actually to the fourth power. Calculating the A value is cumbersome and involves much care. The number of digits following the decimal place are crucial. A good scientific calculator is helpful, I found out. And the values and the formulas that you see are taken directly from the addendum. When calculating both A and B, be careful to not truncate or round any of the numbers, as this will cause the values to be less accurate. And I'll show you what I mean 
as we go through the calculation. Some of the notes, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, that are important as to what these calculations apply to are the full load adjusted and the part load adjusted values are only applicable when all of the following conditions are met. The minimum evaporator leaving temperature is 36 degrees. The maximum condenser leaving fluid temperature is at 115 degrees maximum. And the lift, which we defined, is greater than or equal to 20 degrees and less than or equal to 80 degrees as calculated uh, in, your, in the uh, formula. So anything outside of those ranges do not meet that criteria or standard. And for positive displacement air and water-cooled chilling packages, pack equipment with an evaporator leaving fluid temperature higher than 32 degrees and water-cooled positive displacement chillers with a condenser fluid temperature below 115 degrees also show show compliance with Table 6.8.1c, the difference being in the evaporator leaving temperature primarily. So an example, suppose a project has a 900 ton water-cooled centrifugal chiller. We choose to use path A because we believe it will operate at or near full load. From table 6.8.1c for a chiller greater than 600 tons, the full load value is 0 0.560 kW per ton, and the IPLV is 0 0.5 kW per ton. We're choosing to have this equipment operate with a leaving condenser fluid temperature of 96 degrees and a leaving fluid temperature from the evaporator at 42 degrees. So if we calculate the lift, 96 minus 42 will give us 54 degrees. And using that, we can now calculate the adjusted K value, but first having to calculate the A and B portions. And going through that calculation, we get A at 0.93576 and B at 0 0.9970, which gives us an adjusted K value of 0.932953, lots of numbers. The full load adjusted then comes out to 0 0.600. The part load comes out to 0.536. When I calculated this, the first time uh, I went through and just took the first six decimal places and it gave me these numbers. I had somebody check the math on a different calculator and they chose to not round anything and the numbers came out slightly different. The A value was 0 0.928, 111. The adjusted K came to 0 0.925, 326. The full load at 0 0.605 instead of just 0 0.600, and the PLV came to 0 0.4, 0 0.54035. So while it may not sound much like much in the thousands of, of uh, uh, a number, since that's what the table lists it as, it'd be best to be as accurate as you want to be, particularly when you talk about uh, these uh, requirements with the uh, manufacturers. So. All this to say is just be wary of rounding or truncation too early in the calculation because it may not give you the exact numbers that you want. Sorry. So the adjusted uh, value comparison uh, from Table 6.8.1c we had 0.56 and 0.50, but now with our different operating non-standard conditions, we come with 0.60 kW per ton, which is a 7.1% increase in that uh, energy use, as well as 0.536, which results in a 7.2% increase over the uh, other standard conditions. So this shows that all equipment within the specified operating ranges must comply with 90.1-2010, and for non-standard conditions, the values that you include must be proven by calculations.
Now I'll turn it back to Jason, and uh, we will continue. Thanks, Pat. That was a lot of numbers. Now I want to um, discuss a couple items, talk about manufacturers and engineers and how selection of air cool chillers will be affected with this uh, adopted addendum. Uh, manufacturers will have to consider the new requirements and how to comply with the requirements, which will be adopted by a number of states. Uh, many manufacturers currently offer air and water cooled chillers, which are able to comply with um, parts of the new efficiency requirements. However, some manufacturers only comply with uh, when they're using their higher efficiency or highest efficiency chillers. Uh, the, when, they are, or when they are able to comply, they're typically only complying in part load conditions. So in general, uh, these chillers have a, will probably have a higher first cost, but many locations have utility rebates available, and uh, of course owners will see long-term operating costs that will help hold, uh, hold the total project cost down. Uh, for me, uh, most importantly, let's discuss what engineers will need to do differently when selecting air-cooled chillers uh, in compliance with the addendum requirements. Uh, engineers need to start doing some legwork now so they have a complete understanding about which manufacturers have chillers which fully comply and which ones might be preparing to release equipment that will comply. As mentioned previously, the first cost for some of this high-efficiency equipment is important to consider as to how it affects the total project budget cost. So to provide a little first-hand insight, I discussed these higher efficiency requirements with a industry-leading U.S.-based chiller manufacturer and determined that they're able to comply with the higher efficiency requirements at both full and part load with only their highest efficiency chiller model. Now this is talking about air-cooled chillers only. Lower efficiency models typically complied with the part load efficiencies, but struggled to meet the full load efficiency requirement with these uh, new updates that will take effect. While this probably isn't a true statement for all manufacturers, it is something that engineers will need to educate themselves about for projects, uh, which will be released after the first of the year in states that have adopted the 2010 version of ASHRAE 90.1. Engineers will need to check in the specific states and municipalities uh, where they do work for the requirements on chiller efficiency compliance and if there's any exemptions that might exist that, uh, where addendum CH isn't adopted in those local locations. Now I'd like to share a few numbers about the efficiency requirements for air-cooled chillers. The purpose on the... Uh, the purpose of the information on this slide is to clearly indicate what the values used to be and the, what the values will be now after the January 1st implementation of these efficiency increases. As you can see, the efficiency for chillers less than 150 tons is going from 9.56 to full load efficiency and 12.5 IPLV to 10.1 full load and 13.7 IPLV if following compliance path A. The requirements if path B is followed are 9.7 full load and 15.8 IPLV. The efficiency of chillers 150 tons and larger uh, is as follows. The old requirements were 9.562 full load and 12.75 IPLV. The new requirements for compliance path A are 10.1 full load and 14.1 IPLV. The requirements for compliance with path B are 9.7 full load and 16.1 IPLV. At this point, Pat, why don't you take over and talk about another important item, and that's system balancing. Thanks, Jason. One of the requirements of ASHRAE 90.1-2010 in paragraph 6.7.2.3 includes the requirements for system balancing. Even though it's not part of specifically of addendum CH, which just focuses on the water chilling equipment, it's important to note that this equipment is part of the system and must be balanced to its design conditions, whether the conditions are AHRI standard conditions or non-standard conditions. The other thing is when you prepare project documents, uh, construction documents or uh, written specification requirements, that it must identify the requirements and include 
the requirement for a written test and balance report, operation and maintenance manuals, and perhaps a verified or certified factory test of the chiller to prove that it meets the project design requirements, the required efficiency, and is properly labeled. Labeling is another item that is specifically required by 90.1. And Jason, we can talk about the uh, efficiency requirements, or the, I'm sorry, the commissioning requirements. That's the one. All right, uh, today we thought it'd be important to bring up that there are commissioning requir requirements in 90.1 and just remind everybody of that. Now the requirements in 90.1 are less than detailed, uh, but they do provide some guidance that allows uh, you to, to uh, bring this in as a requirement on your projects. So 90.1 requires that all control systems must be tested. Now this is a very short statement and that was uh, a little bit of paraphrasing from 90.1, uh, but it is short and it's open to interpretation. There's many ways to accomplish that testing, in quotes. Uh, this, uh, the commissioning requirement in 90.1 applies to projects over 50,000 square feet. It's um, interesting how 50,000 square feet is used in ASHRAE, LEED, also references 50,000 square feet for enhanced commission requirements, um, and, uh, and the similarities there are uh, hard to ignore. And then the final um, item that 90.1 discusses on commissioning, uh, the quoted purpose of this commissioning requirement is to ensure that control elements are calibrated, adjusted, and in proper working condition. As a certified commissioning agent myself, I'd promote that all projects are commissioned. There are so many items that are discovered in the commissioning process between design phases, construction phases, that help to both optimize building systems and verify equipment and systems are operating as designed. A third-party commissioning agent is a great way um, to achieve these goals. At this point, Pat, I'm going to turn it back to you to discuss system efficiencies. Thanks, Jason. Uh, ASHRAE 90.1 is all about efficiency, and one of the goals of the, the standard itself is a continued decrease in energy use of the building HVAC system. And the system is defined in 90.1 as the equipment, the distribution systems, and terminals that provide either collectively or individually the process of heating, ventilating, or air conditioning to a building or a portion of a building. This includes the chillers, which we're talking about today, along with fan energy and other forms of heating and cooling for the air or the spaces. But the goal primarily of Addendum CH is a continued decrease in energy use or increased efficiency of water chilling packages at both full load and part load conditions. And I think most of it in the Path B in particular favors the part load condition and how the uh, equipment can be at, operating at its most efficient and achieving the building goals uh, by doing that. ASHRAE 90.1-2010 noted a 16.2 decrease in chiller energy use over the 2004 edition, and this addendum reduces that even further by approximately 8.3% over the uh, original 90.1-2010 version. So to begin the summary is like, how do you select a chiller to meet these con conditions in 2015? Obviously it's important to know as much as you can about the codes and standards by reviewing this addendum in particular. You need to decide on what your project requirements are and what type of chiller can best suit the needs, whether it's air-cooled, water-cooled, or anything in between. You need to choose the path and the values that best suit the planned operation. You need to select the design conditions and re recalculate efficiencies if, you, if needed in order to either to match your goals or to have the equipment selected correctly. And you need to talk to chiller manufacturers. Can their product meet your project needs? 
can they test and label it correctly, which is one of their requirements? Is there only one manufacturer can meet the project requirements, and is that acceptable to your owner or to you? So the, one of the best things is to read and refer to the specific paragraphs in the standard that apply to your project so that the, the requirements can be uh, developed, they can be written and documented, which is also part of what the Energy Code and this particular uh, section requires. And now back to Jason. And to continue our summary on what we discussed today, um, engineers make, need to make sure that they're reviewing any updated code adoptions, exemptions, and requirements, as we previously mentioned. Uh, there's many municipalities, states, and uh, other code authorities that will decide to adopt a piece of this, a piece of that, or adopt it all and um, have an extensive list of exemptions or exceptions that could be followed. Engineers need to also ensure that they understand what options are being offered by chiller manufacturers. Make sure to talk to your local reps. Those are the guys on the ground uh, locally that should have the um, information that you need to design your jobs uh, or, or help select the equipment that's in compliance with the energy codes. Uh, these changes will cause engineers to make another one of those million decisions that we really never get credit for but are expected to just take care of. Finally, with these changes, will they actually save owners money? Maybe not in first cost, but most definitely in operating costs. Are there fears of increased maintenance costs or possibility of equipment failures with newer equipment being released to uh, comply with some of these efficiency requirements? Uh, there's always that, that issue. Every now and then, uh, a manufacturer might have the uh, unexpected issues with uh, a component that, that is new and there's some operational issues. Uh, it's, it's the doing business. You're producing equipment, so who knows what's going to happen. You test and test, but there's always possibly going to be some issues. Um, these are all issues that need to be considered when you're selecting compliant e equipment and systems. And then finally, a quick list of, uh, that we want to review for the changes that are uh, going to be adopted when 90.1 addendum CH is uh, in effect January 1, 2015. The changes include Increased chiller efficiencies and adding requirements for various chiller types. Air-cooled chillers now have multiple compliance path options. Chillers operating in high lift and heat reclaim applications are excluded. Water-cooled positive displacement chillers now need to match efficiency requirements of water-cooled centrifugal chillers. And ASHRAE 90.1 will now reference uh, updated AHRI standards 550, 590, and for uh, and also 551, 591. Uh, these revisions will help clarify the use of testing standards, and the 551, 591 provide a hard metric rating standard with slightly different conditions uh, to those uh, than using inch pound units. So with that, I'd like to turn the presentation back over to Jack to field questions and closing statements. Thanks, Jason, and thanks, Pat, for that fantastic presentation. A lot of information and equations and numbers. And as our presenters prepare for the question and answer session, here's a list of references from today's presentation. Now our presenters will answer questions from the audience. Type your questions for today's presenters in the Ask a Question box on your screen. And please indicate which speaker you would like to answer your question by typing their name before the, the question. And if you are on Twitter, you can tweet your question to us by using hashtag CSEHBACKCHILLER. We will get to as many, <clears throat> as many questions as time allows. Okay, Jason, uh, you get the first question. Um, must all states comply with uh, addendum CH 
Um, and the person who sent this question asks, what if we're not using ASHRAE standard 90.1-2010 yet? So uh, a good way to see which states have adopted which standards on a state level would be to do a web search for the U.S. Department of Energy Building Energy Codes Program. Uh, there's a website that comes up and there's a real nice map that you can link to that shows uh, five or six or seven, maybe eight different um, standards that many states throughout the country are using, ranging from uh, ASHRAE 90.1 2010, uh, seven, four older versions, IECC versions. Um, that's a great resource to use um, if you're trying to figure out what locations might be using what. Uh, as far as um, if you're not using 90.1, uh, or if your state or municipality has not adopted 90.1 2010, that will um, be in effect for you if you're doing a LEED project. LEED specifically references uh, ASHRAE 90.1, and uh, it's our design process here to always use the latest version of 90.1 when we're doing lead projects. So if you are working in that uh, on that type of project, you will be using it even if your local municipality or state has not adopted it. Good answer. So now, Pat, you get this one. When calculating FL and PLV KW per ton efficiencies at non-standard conditions, is it true that values from both path A and path B may be used for the calculations? Uh, no, they cannot. You must choose a path, either path A or path B, in order to do the calculations. So you choose, if you're choosing path B, you must use the full load value and the IPOV value from uh, the path B side for the capacity of the equipment in order to do the calculations. The standard does not allow uh, mixing of the two just to get the best answer that you want. You must choose a path and identify which one that is. Thank you. Um, Jason, next question is for you. Um, I, this may have been already covered, but I think maybe a little bit of elaboration. The specific energy code requirements, um, are there any, and what if energy efficiency issues are involved? Uh, well, looking at energy code, 90.1 is written in code enforceable language, so code authorities are able to adopt it wholly um, without needing to add additional language to it to make it into a that wonderful code format that we all get to look through when we're trying to define the code requirements on a project. Uh, the requirements for all the systems are in 90.1. It uh, 90.1 could be used in a similar fashion to one of the inter uh, international energy conservation codes as well. Okay, um, Pat, here's a good one. The equations for calculating non-standard full load and part load requirements are different in the IECC codes and have different inputs and have different results. This does not make sense to this um, viewer as they both use the same standard full load and part load requirements. Comments or theories on this? That's always a nightmare when you come up against something that <clears throat> references the same but uses different values. Uh, First off, I'd see which, um, st if it's standard 90.1 that was adopted by the AHJ or if it was the IECC codes that were adopted. And I would use the values that were there but then discuss it with the AHJ prior to uh, the uh, completion of the project to determine exactly which one. But why they're different, uh, I, right now I can't answer that. but. Uh, sometimes that occurs and quite frankly I found some different definitions in NFPA a couple of times which I've called them on and uh, they were uh, 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 a little perplexed as well so when you come across that the first thing is a big red flag that says okay I'm going to use this one because you've adopted 
for example, and um, get concurrence with that. Okay, Jason. Um, will the will we be able to achieve uh, these efficiencies in reciprocating chillers? Well, from personal experience, uh, I rarely come across uh, reciprocating compressor air-cooled chillers, uh, if that's what the question is based on. And uh, so I guess I don't know the answer to that. I would assume that manufacturers, if they're going to sell their equipment in the United States, would have to be able to make their equipment comply. Now, as we've seen with other um, code energy efficiency updates, every now and then there's a piece of equipment that doesn't comply and it might not comply for the first couple months of uh, af of time after something's adopted, but typically that's for minor, more minor equipment, in my opinion. Something like a chiller, I would expect that if a manufacturer is selling a reciprocating air-cooled chiller, for sure, domestically, they would be able to comply on January 1st, 2015. Pat, on your slide number 15, the numbers increase with the new standard. So what units are those numbers in? Um, I'm sorry, Jack, on slide 15, the numbers? Increase with the new standard. Uh, what units are those numbers in on slide number 15? Uh, okay, my slide, the slide 15, yeah, the numbers increase from, as far as I know, those are the, the same standard conditions that uh, they're the only difference between the earlier version was they added the uh, GPM per ton evaporator fluid flow to, and a condenser flow as part of the uh, standard conditions so that you would have, which, which essentially results in a 10 degree delta T on the, the uh, evaporator as well as on the condenser. Um, so I'm not exactly sure if, what the increase was. The only difference that I found was that they increased, not increased clarified what the flow rates were. Hey, Jason, um, standards, I'm assuming this viewer means uh, 90.1 and addendum CH, uh, are they mandatory and are they in sync with product availability? Well, as I mentioned during, the, uh, during my discussion on air-cooled chillers, the, uh, there are some manufacturers, uh, one that I went into great detail with uh, that sells equipment domestically, is able to comply with all of these new requirements right now. Now, that's only with their highest efficiency chiller. So that would typically mean a higher first cost piece of equipment. So the good news is they comply. The bad news is you're potentially in a, in a hole uh, and you'll have to specify that more expensive piece of equipment. But if that's what it takes, I guess that's what it takes at this point. The increase in efficiency will drive manufacturers to increase uh, research and production of equipment that's higher efficiency, so that cost will come down over time or come to some moderated level between what things might be now and uh, for lower end to uh, higher efficiency equipment. Okay, Pat, um, how will the changes uh, affect existing buildings? And what timeline does the building owner have to change out old equipment? The, uh, the standard right now, as well as the new efficiencies, uh, does not affect e existing equipment until that equipment is, uh, 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 is replaced. So as long as it's operating well and correctly, um, this uh, addendum CH and the new efficiencies really don't apply until that equipment is changed out. And I think overall a building owner would be looking at uh, trying to get efficient equipment but also continuing system efficiency on the entire uh, HVAC system as things go along just for uh, their benefit of uh, expending less money on their building as time goes by. 
but uh, currently uh, this addendum applies to new equipment or replacement equipment, not to uh, existing installed equipment. Jason, does addendum CH address any requirements for retro commissioning chillers? Uh, the addendum specifically does not address retro commissioning. It applies only to new equipment which will be installed after January 1st, 2015. However, I'll give a plug to retro commissioning projects right now. As a commissioning agent, uh, repeatedly, every time we go in looking at a space to see if there's retro commissioning opportunities, there's always, always an opportunity to squeeze out a few dollars in energy costs. That's a good answer. So, you know, always look for the um, way, ways to include the uh, retro commissioning into the program. Um, has efficiency increase, Pat, this goes to you. Um, has the efficiency increase requirement based on better manufacturing of chillers with the oil and refrigerants um, had any effect? I, I think most manufacturers, uh, uh, in my experience, uh, will say yes, but I think it's been more of a struggle uh, with the new refrigerants and how to uh, use less energy while achieving the same level of uh, 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 not only efficiency, but uh, the design, whether it's tube design or it's the amount of refrigerant or uh, compressor technology, I think all of those things have come into play and uh, not just one uh, aspect because uh, uh, it's not just like changing a tire. Um, these folks have to sometimes redesign uh, their entire equipment in order to get there and they look for the best, I think, capacity uh, for that particular market that they're after. So while They've been forced to uh, to look at that. I think they've been forced both from an energy standpoint as well as a refrigerant standpoint to be able to uh, uh, market or provide the best piece of equipment for the project. And I think that's what every, most manufacturers look for. Okay, we have time for one more question. And Jason, you get it. Discuss the Great. challenges. Yes. Discuss the challenges with adding new controls to existing systems and the sequence of operations for those controls. Briefly. I would say that might be a little bit outside our scope of discussion today, um, but adding uh, from an engineer's perspective and uh, the fact that we work on a lot of existing buildings, I guess I'd like to provide a few comments. Uh, adding controls to any existing systems is uh, a huge advantage for optimizing the operation of those systems. Uh, typically, if there's existing controls, a lot of times they're pneumatic or there's some sort of electric function. And this is, and I'm looking at buildings that are 30 plus years old, uh, well, or 20 plus years old while talking about this. Uh, there's always an opportunity to save energy. There's always a way to do it. The complicating factor typically, in almost all cases, is the cost of implementing that change. I'd like to close by thanking our great speakers, Jason Gerke and Pat Bonza, for generously sharing their time and their expertise.